Thanks, everybody. Okay, so uh, my talk is entitled Asynchronous Programming in R, uh, but I have to give a little disclaimer. It's sort of, but not really about asynchronous programming in R. Um, when I was developing the materials for, uh, for this talk, um, I, I realized I couldn't, like asynchronous programming is such a huge topic, I would have a hard time uh, really explaining it in the way that uh, I found satisfying in, in this, in 20 minutes. Um, and then I thought about all these other topics that come along with asynchronous programming in, in my experience and the stuff that I work on. So there's also uh, parallelism, concurrency, and event-driven programming. So let me define these for you in case you're not really familiar with these. So uh, asynchronous programming is when you call a function, it doesn't block. So normally uh, when you're writing your R code and you're running it, you know, it steps through, it does each thing, and if you do something that takes a long time, like uh, let's say you tell R to go download a file, it stops there, and then once the file is downloaded, it continues and, and your, uh, your, your script continues to run. Uh, if in an asynchronous program, you might, if, if you, there's an asynchronous download, what it would do is you, you're essentially, it would say, hey, go download this file, some other thing in the computer, go download the file, and the code would keep running, and then later you'd check, hey, is my file downloaded, or maybe you might say, or it might call, run a callback and tell you, hey, the file is done now. Um, that's asynchronous programming. Parallelism is when you do multiple things at the same time. Uh, that's very common on modern computers with multiple cores. Concurrency is when it seems like you're doing multiple things at the same time, but um, you might not actually be doing multiple things at the same time. So if you're familiar with JavaScript uh, in a web browser, that's single-threaded, um, and it can seem like a web, a web page is doing a lot of things at once, but uh, it's really splitting its time in between uh, different tasks and switching between them very quickly, so it seems like it's, it just seems like it's doing uh, things in parallel. Uh, and finally, there's uh, event-driven programming, and uh, where you have events that occur, there might be some outside uh, signal, and that causes some, some code to run. Uh, so I was thinking about this, and uh, you know, asynchronous programming is too big, and so I thought I'd try to talk about all of these a little bit, or at least actually a, a common thread that runs through all of them, which is um, a package called Later. And that uh, Later was originally created by Joe Cheng, and um, I don't know if it's a coincidence, but it was a conversation with him that helped me settle on this topic. So thanks, Joe. Um, all right, so I'm going to show you a demo here of, um, let me see if I can make this go away. I'll try to make this large enough to, well, it'll be sort of, wow, yikes, semi-visible. All right, so let's say, well, you don't have to see the specific code, the exact code here. Let's say I'm creating a data frame called data, and uh, I've populated it with some x and y values, and uh, this plot magically appeared in our studio here. And if I modify it so I square all the x values, um, that plot redraws, and now I have a you know a par parabola shape here. And I can do the same with y. And if I restore data to what it was before, um, it it replots again. So uh, there's something going on here. It's not any magic from our studio, the IDE, but um, it involves uh, it involves later. It, it, this is and. What you're seeing here is sort of, uh, at least from the user perspective, this is event this is event driven programming. So I'm not telling it to replot every time I change data, but every time I change data, it causes this plotting code to re-execute. And I ran that actually ahead of time before I started this talk, um, and I'll show it to you in a little bit. But let's talk about uh, let's talk about what the later package does. So later provides something called an event loop. An event loop is a queue of functions that will run in the future. Uh, and it's, uh, it's very similar to set timeout in JavaScript, if you're familiar with JavaScript. Um, and if this is confusing to you, I will show you a very simple example of how later is used. So uh, you load the later package. I'm setting a flag to tell me when I'm, uh, to signal when something is done. And then I say, later, run this function here, which prints out a message and uh, updates the flag uh, after five seconds. And then at the end, I'll say, well, I'm not done, run now. It means keep running uh, th these functions that are in this event loop in this, in this queue. So let's do this. Let's run this stuff here. And uh, you won't be surprised to see that after five seconds, it prints out this message, uh, hello world. And I know there's people out there who have already figured out how to write this in about six lines of code to implement this. Um, so this part is, this part is not, really that difficult. 
Uh, but what later, what you might be a little bit more surprised to see is that if I run this same code here, um, and I don't do run now, and we wait five seconds, it will also print hello world. So uh, later has some C code that runs and uh, when your R console is idle, when, your R's, when R, the call stack is empty and you're not running any, anything else, it will continue running this event loop. Okay, so that plot watching code that I showed, or that uh, you saw the plot watcher before, and this is the code. So what it does is first, uh, this is, it's, it's pretty simple. So I'm just setting data to null and the last value to null. And then I have this function called plot watch. And uh, if, if the data is not null and if it's different from the last value, then plot it and then update the last value. So that's all really standard R code. The thing that's different is right here I call later plot watch. So it's this, this function uh, is rescheduling itself to run after a quarter second. And then uh, after we define the function, we have to kick it off, we have to get it started by, by invoking the function once. And then, uh, this, and it's doing what's sort of, um, I guess you might call it a, a polling loop, where it just it keeps running every quarter of a second. And every time data changes, it executes the plotting code. Um, so later also has a C API. This is important when you're doing a lot of this, um, when you're doing asynchronous programming, because a lot of the times you have to interface with external libraries. Um, so from C code, you can call later to schedule a C function to execute. There's a C function later. Um, and that C function that you scheduled XQ can in turn call an R function. And, uh, and also a very, another very important point is that this function, the later, the later function is thread safe. So you can have another thread schedule something to run. Uh, it can schedule an R function to run. Okay, so that's a brief overview of later. Um, it's, it, what it does is, is pretty simple, but it unlocks a lot of possibilities. So here's some real world uses of later. And I'm gonna uh, show you some stuff, uh, some demos and explain how some of these things work. Uh, so one thing that we've worked on recently is a WebSocket client. So WebSocket is a protocol for um, basically for communicating between uh, computers um, through, a, well, through a fancy web server. So uh, this is, this is how it's used, so I create a WebSocket, I say WebSocket new and connect to the server, and then I tell it, uh, hey, when you receive a message, invoke this function. So this is, a, this is a event driven programming here, uh, but it doesn't actually call this function right away. And what it does, this function will print out, hey, I've received this, this whatever the message is. All right, so I've set up that uh, event handler, uh, and then at the end I can say, I can tell it to send hello world. So let's see this in action. Now what it's doing is not very surprising. Will not be very surprising. Um, so if you're having trouble, if you can't see it, uh, this is the same code that you saw before. And uh, so I sent hello world and what I received back is that same string reversed. So it's talking to a WebSocket server that you know, takes the string, reverses it and sends it back. So it's just doing this really basic uh, transformation on it. All right. Uh, now the way that this works internally uh, is used is used as polling similar to that plot watcher that we or the data watcher that we had before. So um, we have this arrow representing time, and uh, several times per second we're doing we're polling and we're checking for any if there's any input or output that has happened on this WebSocket. Now at some arbitrary point in time, uh, in R you might tell it to send a message, send hello world, and that gets that puts it in this output queue, but the output that output queue isn't handled uh, until this polling event here. And when we get to the polling event, that actually calls out to a C++ library that does, you know, handles all this, all this input and output stuff. And it sends a message to the server. Um, when that happens, the server sends a message back. Uh, and then that, that message sits in the input queue uh, until the next polling event happens. And when that, when, that, when that occurs, then it calls the on message handler and it prints out, hey, I've received this hello world reversed. And I just, uh, in this particular slide, the blue indicates that this is, this is something that was triggered by the polling event that, that later provided. Okay, so that's how the WebSocket package works. At least, 
that's how the CRAN version of WebSocket works. Um, on GitHub, there's actually the development version of WebSocket has been changed uh, to use threads. Actually, let me show you one thing real quick about this. So if you're familiar with this sort of programming, uh, you know that um, polling is not like the ideal way to do this. There's, there's a little bit of latency that can occur between these events here. Um, and it also, uh, if you're doing a lot of polling really quick, it can, it can use CPU time that shouldn't be, that really shouldn't be used. Um, but it's simple to implement. So uh, the, the development version of WebSocket is threaded. And this is, uh, and so there's two threads. There's this main R thread, and then it launches a, a, another thread that handles the input and output. All right, so if I tell it to send the message from, and that, that happens in R, uh, what it does is it calls the C function, or C++ function send, which is thread safe, which queues, which tells the IO thread, hey, I want you to send this message. And the IO thread uh, at this point will be idle, and so it will, it will deal with this request right away, uh, send the message to the server, the server sends something back, and um, if the IO thread is idle then, it will immediately use later to tell the R thread uh, this is the C function later to tell the R thread, hey, handle this message that I just got. And if the R thread is sitting idle at that point, it'll, it'll print it out. If the R thread is busy at that time, um, like represented by that red bar there, uh, then it will, it will wait until it's, uh, it's done doing whatever computation it's doing, and then it will handle that queued function. All right, so, that's, uh, so these are two common ways of handling uh, input and output, uh, asynchronous I.O with polling and with threads. All right. Uh, now another use that we have is uh, a web server called the HTTP UV. This, uh, this package, you might have heard of it before. It has an awkward name. Um, it underlies Shiny and Plumber. And, um, and to start a web server, it's actually very simple. You just say start server, you give it the, um, the port you want to listen on, and then this function here, which it's a callback that gets invoked when an event happens, uh, an incoming request occurs. So when you get an incoming HTTP request, it calls this function and passes in uh, this object called rec. And in this case, I'm just having it create a web page that has the time and the path that was requested, and then it returns some other HTTP stuff along with that. So you can, you can imagine that you can use this, you can use this um, in all sorts of different ways. You can, it just will execute an R function whenever you get an HTTP request. So um, I'll show you this real quick in action. What it will do is also not surprising since I've already talked about it. Um, it gives you the time and the path that was requested. So that was just slash. I could say our studio, oops, our studio conf, and then it prints out that path there. Um, all right, now I'm just going to show you some other cool stuff, um, some fun stuff. So uh, I also started before this. Before I started doing the talk, I started up a another HTTP UV application, um, which provides a remote R console, a REPL, so I can, you know, can say, you know, one, one plus one, sum of one through ten, and this is this this uh, is causing R code to execute. So this is actually using WebSocket connection. It's uh, the the web browser sends this string over the WebSocket. And then the R process gets the string, it evaluates it, captures the output, and then sends it back. So that's what's happening here. Uh, the interesting thing about this is it's actually running in the same R process that we've been doing all the rest of this stuff. So if I change data to be, um, let's say data x, data x squared, that did not work at all. Oh, there it goes. Okay. <laughs> Whew. All right. So uh, this is this is running in the same R process. Um, all right. And of course, you're familiar with Shiny. Shiny uh, is based on HTTP UV. So I can run this Shiny up here, which, which is displaying the same the same data. Uh, and I can, if I randomize it, it'll you know if I click this button, randomize it does. You, you've seen this sort of thing with a Shiny app. Um, and again, these are these are connected here. So when I randomize the data, I'm using poor shiny programming practices where I'm modifying a global variable. Um, but for this demo, it's good. Um, and it's, it's changing that plot right there. Okay, so, um, 
so that's a taste of some of the things that are possible. There's one other thing I want to show um, using a package called uh, Cremote, which is a headless, uh, headless Chrome web browser uh, package, which uses a lot of asynchronous programming. And I won't go into depth about it right now. I just want to show some other fun stuff that you can do. So I can start a Cremote session. I'll navigate to the same application. Um, and I'll take a screenshot of it. And when it takes a screenshot, uh, it actually will cause that screenshot to appear in this viewer pane here. This is, this is not the Shiny app here. This is a screenshot of a Shiny app. If, if you see, I can sort of drag this around here. And just to prove to you that it's actually, oops. So I tried to run it in RStudio, but the RStudio console is blocked. I have to run it over here because this one is driven by later. Um, this is a, this is, you can get a view into the headless browser and then you can sort of interact with it here. I can click on randomize over there. Uh, and then if I take a screenshot of it again, you'll see that, oh, sorry, I did it again. Okay, let's, if I take a screenshot again, um, you'll see that that button is sort of grayed, which indicates that it was selected, which is what I was doing over there. All right, so that's, uh, that's the fun demos. All right, so let's get back to what we saw here. So uh, we, saw, we saw this WebSocket server that reverses strings, a uh, web server that shows you the time, um, a web server with this remote R console, which you can use while you're running a Shiny application, uh, running a Shiny app. We watch, had this plot data watcher, and we had this headless Chrome client. All of these use later. That's what makes it all possible for them to run concurrently. And, uh, and this is all in one R process. Okay, so uh, one thing, I, I, I took a look at the, uh, the later CRAN page and I, I looked at the packages that we're using later and one thing I, I noticed was that even though it's been out for a couple of years, there's not that many packages that use it and all of them are maintained by people that work at our studio. So uh, I'm hoping that, you know, we have a lot of this knowledge internally from, from like we've got battle scars working on this stuff, but hopefully, um, hopefully if you're working on, you know, if you're working on async programming or parallelism or concurrency uh, and event-driven programming, this will be useful for you. And uh, I have a, the URL here. It's not, the materials aren't actually up there right now, but they will be. Thank you. Thanks, Winston. That was fascinating. Uh, I can assure you that I am using your work. <laughs> <laughs> I have um, Cremote writing on a scheduled basis to take photographs of, of the work my colleagues are doing. Um, for those of you that are leaving, uh, we are just carrying on with questions, so please uh, do so quietly if you can. Uh, question number one. Um, does later deal with the issues of tail call stack optimization that, that could arise from the rec recursive event loop format? Uh, it does not. That's actually a great question. Uh, you have to be, I, want, I wanted to mention it, but I didn't have time that if you're going to be calling the function it, itself, you have to make sure not to create any closures that, uh, uh, that will keep increasing the depth of the call stack. So you have to create a function outside of your function that you're calling. Okay, and the second question is, if later is running and you want to run another, what happens, oh, there we go, and you want to another, uh, run another line of code, does the new line you are running jump ahead of later, or does it wait those five seconds to run? So if you, uh, it will jump ahead of later. So after five seconds have elapsed, even whatever you've written, whatever you've done before, um, it, it won't wait an extra five seconds. It'll wait for five seconds total, unless R is occupied at the moment that the, that callback would occur. Thank you. And uh, last question, um, it's getting quite a few votes. Is there a way to prioritize uh, different asynchronous um, streams? Different asynchronous. Is there a way to prioritize different asynchronous streams? Um, that, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, so I'm sorry I can't answer that. If you ask the question, do you just want to shout out and clarify? No? <laughs> okay. Winston, thank you very much. This was fascinating. Thank you.